Good afternoon. I'm Carol Christ. I'm the chancellor of UC Berkeley. Welcome to the second of this year's 111th annual Martin Meyerson Faculty Research Lectures. For more than a century, Berkeley's Academic Senate has singled out distinguished members of our faculty whose research has changed the trajectory of their disciplines and of our understanding of the subject that they've dedicated their careers to. These lectures shine a light on an essential part of our mission, which is creating new knowledge. The curiosity and creativity that fuel the quest to learn and understand are at the heart of our commitment to making the world a better place through what we discover, what we teach, and the public service we provide. This year's lectures represent the continuation of a treasured tradition that has recurred annually, with one exception, in the wake of World War I and the influenza pandemic, the uh, faculty research lectures were suspended in 1919. But in 2020, when we had um, another pandemic, um, when virtual events were in vogue and Zoom kept us together, these lectures went on. Being selected to deliver a faculty research lecture is rightfully seen as a high honor. To stand out among peers who exemplify academic excellence is no small feat. For students, members of the campus community, and the public, this is a wonderful way of experiencing scholarly research of the highest caliber. I'd like to welcome the past recipients who are with us today. Professors, please stand when I call your name, and then uh, hold your applause while everyone is standing. Uh, Robert Alter, Walter Alvarez, uh, Daniel Boyarin, uh, Alexander Chorin, Marvin Cohen, Jan de Vries, William Dietrich, Inez Fung, Catherine Gallagher, Eric Gruen, Martin Jay, Thomas LeCur, uh, Stephen Lindau, uh, Anthony Long, Francine Mizzello, Francesca Rushberg, Barbara Romanowitz, Pamiel Samuelson, and Brigitte Whaley. And let's have a round of applause for them all. And I apologize if anybody came in late and I didn't see them. Michael Nylon is the Jane K. Sather Chair in the Department of History, today's lecturer. Her work on the Western and Eastern Han dynasties is remarkably broad, involving several forms of historical inquiry, gender studies, manuscript culture, archeology, span material culture, rhetoric, and philosophy. She has sought to understand as well as possible the texts that her historical subjects knew. Accordingly, she's translated canonical texts, among them Sun Xu's uh, The Art of War and Yang, Sheng's uh, The Canon of Supreme Mystery, her many interpretive and historical works have become classics. The Chinese Pleasure Book, Chang'an 26 BCE, An Augustan Age in China, The Letter to Ren An and Sima Chan's Legacy, the five Confucian classics. Her current work focuses on the political theories and practices of the early empires. She teaches graduate and undergraduate courses on conceptions of the body and the body politic, on the environment and environmental ethics, and on local administration outside the capital at the county and at the sub-county level. Her latest books are a mammoth translation of the Han era documents and a co-authored study of the politics of the common good in China entitled The Air We Breathe, The World We Want. Please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Nylon, whose lecture is titled, The Utility of the Useless, Reflections on History Today.
Thank you. I am truly honored today to give the Meyerson Lecture on behalf of the humanities and social sciences. My role, as I see it, is to explain a bit about why my work is hailed as field-defining by some, if excoriated by others. My critics give me too much credit, I think. <laughs> Secondly, to conjure the wider field of the human sciences, I will explain my specific approach to doing history. Because so many inside and outside my department are historians, and it's a field that nowadays is all too often dismissed as irrelevant to contemporary life. The third and final part of my talk today addresses present trends in the university. In the belief that 20 odd years in the trenches affords a useful perspective on how, when, and why we have sometimes lost our way at this fine university. I offer this critique as a loyalist. I was a Berkeley undergraduate and I have been proud to call Berkeley my academic home. Part one, who am I? Taking stock of who I am as teacher and researcher, a process compelled by the recent deaths of multiple mentors, I find that I am my teacher's student, no more, no less. In the late 1970s, when I began the study of the early empires in China, roughly the same time period as the Roman Republic and Empire. No university in North America had specialists for that time period. Yes, David Keatley taught Shang history here at Berkeley, but Shang was a millennium earlier than my early empires. And anyone thinking that nothing consequential had occurred during that long swath of history uh, was not, to my mind, a good historian, only perhaps a follower of Hegel, who opined that China had no history at all. <laughs> Having been trained as an undergraduate by two giants in Chinese history, Joseph Levinson and Frederick Wakeman, I was a woman determined to work in a non-existent field, and as such, I suffered no illusions that I would be able to secure a job after completing my PhD. So I had the luxury, if you will, to study what I wanted, more or less, um, with whom I wanted. Um, let me begin from Nathan Sivan, premier historian of Chinese science, I learned how to construct stories from the ground up that could upend centuries of pseudo-analysis. Every five years, Nathan would deliver a caustic article highlighting the narrow-minded and unmethodical conjectures of his most famous colleagues inside and outside of China. Let me provide a single example, one of many I could adduce. On the so-called placebo effect in modern biomedicine, Nathan remarked, since an inert substance cannot possibly be the cause of a significant improvement in the patient's well-being, the thoughtless usage of the term placebo effect results from the collective irrationality of diligently rational biomedical researchers. From Michael Lowy in Cambridge, England, I learned best practices in correlating archeological evidence with received texts. Also, why premature big pronouncements could set a new field back for generations, which caution is particularly warranted for early China, um, where more excavated texts and artifacts come to light almost daily. For this reason, perhaps my three favorite books have each taken 10 or more years to produce. From Henry Rosemont and Herb Fingerett, I learned simple humanity, that people living in the antique social groups frequently evinced more complex identities and allegiances than those of our own more conformist era. And from the world-renowned linguist Paul Royce, I learned the most astonishing lesson of all, 
that I was actually to read only what was on the page before me instead of filling in the gaps from other texts so that the cultural difference between the ancients and myself collapsed. I was by no means offended when Professor Chen Shun Zheng at Taiwan National University told me that my only advantage over my well-trained Chinese peers lay in my acute awareness that I knew almost nothing. <laughs> and so must take no generalizations for granted. Like all of my teachers, beginning with Levinson, Professor Chun taught me that to disdain the ancients comes at a stiff price, a probable lack of self-understanding aided by an inability to dig deep into an era's unexamined ideas. So like Ursula Le Guin, words are my matter, and like Inez Feng, I study atmospherics, the unspoken calculations lying behind the surface rhetoric. For I care not only about how things turned out, but also about how they came to turn out in the way that they did. My work has been field changing then for the simple reason that I ask stupid questions and then test nearly every hypothesis I can muster by every means at my disposal. Entire years I have spent investigating the evolution of key words or tracing word clusters and categories. Take the graph once routinely translated as Confucian. To how many groups did that graph once refer, I asked. I have also tried to reconstruct the setting for events in the remote past so that I can repopulate those spaces with the right number and range of actors. Then too, some proportion of my work has always called out jingoistic views of imperial China. Three, I find especially galling. The ideas that the Chinese can't do abstractions, that they didn't perform autopsies, and that they congenitally have always preferred autocracies. In fact, the ancient thinkers in China outlined an infinite space theory by the second century BC. Their medical handbooks at that date stipulated how to conduct forensic investigations on opened corpses. And finally, the early inhabitants of the North China Plain devised sophisticated governing policies and institutions that surpassed, in not a few ways, those of early modern Europe or indeed America today. Curiosity, craftsmanship, and a determined to get things as right as humanly possible requires good historians to survey all of the evidence, to assess it by proven methods, and to refuse to hazard speculations unless they are expressly labeled as such. Of course, historians of early China bear, somewhat like underrepresented minorities, a huge interpretive burden. We must not only keep track of what we can know from our sources, and most importantly, not know, but we must equally understand what stereotypes most interlocutors will happily foist on us in order to render us unworthy of serious consideration. Much of my work records the theft of history, if with less panache than Jack Goody, the anthropologist. Part two, as a southerner who grew up in an 1803 house with slave shackles in the basement, I have long borne in mind William Faulkner's saying, the past is never dead, it isn't even past. As a historian, I am continually confronted by people who plainly have no idea what it is that historians do. The usual error consists of imagining that historians merely line up names, dates, and events in chronological order. That would be like believing that professional mathematicians do nothing more than line up the, the numbers zero through nine. In high school studying AP history, and blessedly never since, I was taught that the historian's sole job was to establish a straight line from cause to effect. In college, 
I learned differently. On this, let me cite Paul Vane, perhaps the greatest of French historians. History, history has long been defined as an explanatory account featuring causes. To explain something used to pass for being the sublime part of the historian's craft. Explanation consisted of finding a reason garbed as a cause that is a scheme the rise of the bourgeoisie, the forces of production, the revolt of the masses that brought great and exciting ideas into play. But let us suppose instead that explanation is reduced to envisioning a polygon of minor causes that do not remain constant from one set of circumstances to the next and that never fill the specific places that a pattern would assign them in advance. Then another task, no less interesting, emerges to reveal the unpredictable contours of this polygon and to restore the original silhouette to events, which silhouette has been concealed under borrowed garments. As Vane writes, truths are always products of the imagination and the imagination has always governed not reality, not reason, or the ongoing work of the negative. The imagination is a faculty at what's transcendental insofar as it creates our world and historical, since cultures succeed one another and each one is different. Men do not find the truth, they create it as they create their history. Contra well-meaning types, history is not defined by diligent work in archives or by avoiding cross-chronological and cross-cultural research to assert professional purity. Nor is history a process of disnification, fashioning crass entertainments for fame and profit. But to build up a plausible semblance or silhouette of past events, one needs to marshal and review incredible amounts of material. No wonder I spend my days and nights measuring the sizes of various spaces in old Chang'an to say roughly how many people could have sat, slept, or worshipped there. No wonder I found myself counting individual graphs in a single chapter from the document's classic to show that today's version is appreciably longer than the version circulating in 300 BC. Americans have long thought that history is made by the victors, a sentiment not authored, but certainly invoked by Hermann Goering during the Nuremberg trials. Or they think that history is more or less bunk, the second gem comes from Henry Ford, of course, who was himself a dedicated fascist. Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and their ilk have scoffed at the discipline of history, boasting that they made history while historians, as part of the reality-based community, were condemned to scurry around afterwards, trying to make sense of their magisterial acts. But this attitude is all too common these days. Erdogan in Turkey, Modi in India, the list grows ever longer. Only last week, Javier Millet, president of Argentina, fired the 13 historians serving on the commission investigating the military's role in the decades-long reign of terror and human rights abuses. Evidently, the script is the same for all dictators. Historians are castigated as unduly negative nitpickers who traffic in outdated views. In many countries today, one can go to jail or worse for being a careful historian. That history evokes such outrage in the autocrats professing allegiances to so many warring ideologies suggests it does retain great utility today. Thus, at the risk of boring a learned audience, I will outline six main functions of history. First, 
Substantive engagement with past histories of different cultures allows us to see that contra candide and many politicians, we do not now live in the best of all possible worlds, nor do Anglo-Americans inherit a uniquely glorious set of traditions. But absent visit to other times and places, we lack the Archimedean vantage point from which to assess the validity of contemporary arguments and arrangements. Let me cite a relevant example. In 1156, in China of all places, all heads of households, both male and female, in an ethnically diverse region, voted in a massive referendum, county by county, to register their preferred mode of taxation. Poof. This referendum recording the votes of roughly 1.5 million people makes the triumphalist Euro-American claims based on our supposed descent from Athenian Democrats look laughable. Pray tell, how long did it take for women to get the vote? And how long before some minorities will acquire equal access to voting today? Although all disciplines have their charlatans who are paid to muddy the issues, think tobacco, climate change, and abortion for the scientists, doing careful history is bound to ruffle the American addiction to irreality, so compellingly described by James Baldwin in his writings. Second, familiarity with past histories of different cultures inevitably acquaints us with the stunning array of values and modes of operations that people have devised to make meaning and bring stability to their lives. We confront in Fire Abend's formula an unfathomable abundance, or in Tumba's an arsenal of possibilities, from which we may pull more collaborative local models when rethinking our current global crises. Again, I offer an example from China. The early empires in China instituted the first proto-welfare states in history, reasoning that the people create their rulers, and so the rulers in return should show their gratitude to their subjects. Five afflicted groups, orphans, the aged and disabled, widows and widowers were singled out for regular assistance, and repeated finds of local registers archeologically excavated demonstrate that such practices were pervasive and not just idle theories. During the New Deal, as some will remember, Henry Wallace, Secretary of Agriculture, invoked the early Chinese institution of the ever-constant granary in agricultural planning on behalf of small farmers. Equally, investigations into the regular mechanisms whereby the early empires in China increased equity and inclusion may suggest new possibilities today. Third, careful study of history can tell us what initiatives are likely to work, if only because human beings' primary motivations have changed surprisingly little over time. That said, the pre-modern Chinese view of history as mirror reflected the fact, pun intended, that their bronze and silver mirrors, in stark contrast to today's glass versions, both blurred and distorted the images the mirrors transmitted. As a result, pre-modern thinkers were happy to contemplate probabilities rather than certainties, while insisting that the study of history afforded signs to the discerning viewer. As a student of the Korean and Vietnam Wars, I found myself better equipped than many to predict the outcome of the Iraq War. Fourth, because history allows us to make informed judgments concerning the likely consequences of certain courses of action, it schools us in habits of thought that counter both mindless optimism and mindless despair. It suggests the utility of long-term thinking as opposed to the soundbite, the TikTok slogan, the election cycle, and so on. 
Thus, thinking historically inevitably forces us to take more factors into account, leading quickly to the realization that short-term gains do not always translate into long-term successes. Which behaviors and institutions then are sustainable over the long haul? Above all, history teaches us to ask who benefits, where benefits include psychological comforts as well as monetary gains. The economist Amartya Sen asks the right question when he asks, how do we preserve human capabilities, the real freedoms that people have to have in order to achieve their best selves? New technology has surely added capabilities for some, but just as surely diminished opportunities for others. Good historians bear witness to that. Fifth. It is therefore the historians among us, I would contend, who can suggest how best to put ethical constraints on the sciences, and also the students of history who are well-versed in methods to disentangle misinformation and disinformation from more reliable sources. Luckily for me, I was trained out of the propensity to blame all of today's failures on the pre-modern past. Sixth, best of all, the human sciences, like the STEM fields, teach complexity as the greatest key to successful lives going forward. Surplus is the guarantor and not the obstacle to real life resilience, as anyone who follows environmental history knows. Any ecosystem, in other words, must have a surplus of resources, blah, 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 a surplus of resources if it is to survive life's ordinary travails. Putting all one's eggs in one basket has always been a losing proposition throughout history. Aiming for the greatest efficiency in the leanest system shows little understanding, especially when the university is not a business not a competition, and not a diploma mill. For too long now, some in leadership positions have given short shrift to the values besides money making that make life worth living. Either they have not read, or it has suited their purposes to ignore the evidence-based studies the latest last year in the Chronicle of Higher Education showing that humanities grads do quite well in the job market, thank you, whether at the undergraduate or postgraduate level. The early Chinese empires were stable in the main because their advisors thought long and hard about what human beings needed, including symbol systems, spectacles, institutional checks and balances, and cross-cutting hierarchies. They also thought about what people eventually rebelled against and what sustained people in their communities. The university is not here to maintain people in their comfort zones. The university is not here to be in loco parentis. And to go forward with any confidence into an unknown future, I contend, we probably need to go backwards more often into many histories but especially the history of this particular place as enforcer of the loyalty oath in 1950, but by 1964 as the site of the free speech movement. That brings me to part three of my talk, why the university? Today, public opinion polls and business magazines often dispute the value of a college or postgraduate education. To me, the university retains its value for several reasons. First, it can teach students to think and write clearly so that they may identify and articulate their own dreams and fears. Second, it can teach students to identify can't, um, AKA tosh and rot. And third, it can teach people how to listen I think we need that more than anything now. Surely in the age of misinformation and groupthink, 
those missions are all the more important to keep in mind inside and outside of our classrooms. To further probe the problem of today's university, it may prove useful for me to identify my worst moments at UC Berkeley. If only because my Berkeley experiences are hardly atypical. The first bad time was not 9-11, as someone might surmise. I had just come. It was during the following spring, my second semester here, when all but one of my students in a small seminar informed me that their pastors knew that since Bush prayed to God, the Iraq invasion was bound to succeed. Recall that I had left my undergraduate days shortly after the bombing of Cambodia in 1970, and it is hardly strange that I seriously considered leaving Berkeley at that point. Now I have my slide. Can I get my slide? I have to, oh, it's not gonna let me do it? Come on. Thanks. A still worse slough of despond was occasioned by this poster proudly decorating lampposts on campus about a decade ago. Its blatant appeal to male privilege, its celebration of the sciences in thrall to big bucks, epitomized all the arrogant disregard that I had gone into academia to avoid. And while I try my level best to remain constructive, I confess to feeling lately that Berkeley has been killing me softly. I concur with the assessment offered by the Berkeley Faculty Association that faculty morale on campus has never been lower. And I worry that slow attrition is plainly what you see Berkeley envisions for the human sciences. A friend of Li Zeho, one of the architects of the Tiananmen Square democracy movement in 1989, I renounce all revolutions. They tried them in China and we've tried them here in Berkeley. Many of you may have forgotten the attempt in 2010 to 2011 to reimagine undergraduate education in Berkeley, in part by upending education at Berkeley under the auspices of operational excellence, a byword for incompetence then and now. The rationale was that the new university would facilitate more fluid career paths and more global studies to meet the coming wave of the future. That 2010 plan proposed doing away, sorry, I'm not supposed to be back there, but I really, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, um, uh, the 2010 plan proposed doing away with three liberal arts undergraduate requirements. Interestingly, those in the foreign languages, in history, and in philosophy and ethics. The plan retained only the requirements for sciences and pooled graduate students in such a way that a physics student might have ended up teaching sections in early China. In a manner eerily Trumpian, though I wouldn't have had that word um, at that point to name it, expertise in the human sciences was devalued and amateurism upheld. Thankfully, that plan did not pass muster with its final committee. It was narrowly voted down. The campus escaped a total restructuring for ill-defined ends, in other words, just by a hair's breadth. To enhance academic work here, I make four suggestions, none of them earth shattering. First, our student evaluation system should not ask students to rate whether the course is easy or not, the present emphasis, but whether the course encourages students to rethink what they learned earlier, often in high school. Why this proposal? I think it's important to register how risk averse and narrow our teaching has become. Neither the evaluations nor the Berkeley BioBib promote wrestling with tough questions lacking an immediate resolution. Second, UC Berkeley, while boasting of faculty governance, is far more hierarchical than any other place I've ever taught. Bryn Mawr 
and Princeton are the two. This is not entirely a question of scale, though scale is frequently cited as convenient excuse for multiple decisions made without prior consultation with the faculty. Faced with a real injustice to a colleague, I was told by an excellent ex-chair of a department, not mine, that I must be summoned by a dean for questioning or not. Not very few deans have office hours, judging from their landing pages, and regular meetings with department chairs or with the whole department do not suffice to address individual and collective interests. Establishing better and more frequent communication channels could go a long way to improve aspects of life here at UC Berkeley. That is what most people mean when they call for greater transparency. Third, on no public campus outside Berkeley, not UCLA, not Michigan, not Oregon, does the special sponsored project office take a whopping 69% of any fellowship award, which typically in the humanities run to only 25 or $30,000. In response, I've simply abandoned the position of PI and moved my workshops away from the campus. But few junior faculty needing promotions can do this easily, and ultimately such penny-pinching hurts Berkeley's standing. Fourth, the library must be adequately funded. By now, we all live much of our research and teaching lives online. At the same time, what's online is often A, inadequate, B, worse for the environment given the usual facilities for cloud storage, and C, expensive given how often the basic software has to be updated. The cloud is hardly trouble-free, in other words. And look what I see, and now we'll see if I can get it for you, when I go online to research my field. Look at all those locked keys. That means I cannot see. I can only see the titles of what's being done in China. So here we are. Um, don't get me wrong, some subject libraries on campus can be closed, but no decisions about library closing should ever be made in August, presenting faculty with unpalatable fait accompli. At a minimum, current gifts to the library should acknowledge the severity of cuts in the past and put in places immune to a later clawing back as happened under Breslauer. In addition, the development office should be instructed to locate donors for the library system. Better funding only makes real fiscal sense after all since draconian cuts to the East Asian Library, to take but one example, risks the university's continuing ability to receive five to seven million dollars in annual federal funding as an East Asian Center of Excellence. I'm a science junkie, but at the root of a constellation of problems is, I believe, the naive belief that STEM is the way to save Berkeley and lead it into the future. Unfortunately, many Berkeley leaders seem unaware that the internet is not a smooth, well-oiled machine. It's a messy patchwork that has been assembled over decades and is held together with a digital equivalent of scotch tape and bubble gum, with much of it thanklessly maintained by a small army of volunteer programmers who fix the bugs, patch the holes, and ensure the whole rickety contraption. The uncomprehending types cannot resist the allure of big data cobbled together from disparate sources for differing purposes, and especially dangerous now that AI trains itself on its self-manufactured data, exponentially increasing the untruths while purporting to spit out objective algorithms. Good historians have the tools to continually remind people that there are distortions. I would like to point out five realities on the Berkeley campus. 
in, that affect the Berkeley campus. Number one, in some STEM fields, there's already a glut of candidates for the existing positions, as the Chronicle of Higher Education noted last year. Two, the human sciences are so much cheaper than lab-driven fields when it comes to attaining world-renowned excellence. Three, UC Berkeley is not MIT, nor Caltech, nor Stanford, nor should it aspire to be. My colleagues at Stanford in the humanities complain that their deans have instructed them to assign no more than 20 pages of reading in classes, lest their students be distracted from more enriching activities involving startups. Why give our institution over to this? If the answer is, well, that's what parents want for their children and they pay tuition, then I think the university has spectacularly failed in its duties to publicize the benefits of a broader education. The Chronicle of Higher Education and numerous philanthropic organizations have already compiled the numbers for us. Why not publicize them um, more widely? Four, students and sometimes their parents feel that Berkeley has failed them since many undergraduate BAs know no foreign languages or foreign cultures unless they come from the foreign <laughs> countries themselves. They can't always read well, and many of them are advised to do their level best to avoid learning to write well by their academic mentors. Number five, the future is dark, said Virginia Woolf. And that is perhaps the best thing for it to be. Designing, I'm really having trouble managing this, um, uh, laying my papers down, forgive me. The future is dark, said Virginia Woolf, and that is perhaps the best thing for it to be. Designing desirable futures for our students is frankly impossible when we've got little idea of what the future geopolitically and technologically holds. But resilience relies upon plenitude, meaning an abundance of seemingly unnecessary resources. I admit university tuition is ridiculously expensive. I could afford my tuition with a summer job. And history, foreign languages, and the arts are not efficient to learn, admittedly. But serious engagement in the humanities and the arts can yield a lifetime of rewarding practices that expand one's sense of the world beyond the confines. And here, I'm going to try to go back. This is not doing what I want it to do. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back to here. During the pandemic, I was given lost time a recollection of life in a Soviet prison camp whose inmates managed to lecture one another on the value of Proust, a miracle in a world for a non-believer. In light of the foregoing, I want to devote my few remaining moments to possible futures, the first dystopian and the second more hopeful. The first is that we continue mindlessly along the current path. I don't mean to suggest administrators are mindless. Um, <laughs> what I mean to say is look what we're following. Um, we're following the US government trends in defining um, and defunding the human sciences. That would be to diminish our global competency. Essentially, continuing on that path would confirm with the author of Sacred Activism in quotes, that we have been robbed of the courage or power to think an alternative thought. The smarter course going forward, I wager, is to ask not what is immediately realistic or practical or viable, but rather what riches are imaginable despite the perennial budget crises. The UC system has an $150 billion endowment NPR reports that. And it has always seemed to be able to find the cash to initiate costly, complete overhauls of its internal systems, such as HR. It's time, past time, really, to discuss our values 
And as Louis Menon wrote in his new essay on academic freedom, if capitulation isn't working, not much is lost by trying some defiance. We can do better. Let us see what can be done. In conclusion, I would invoke two gods in my intellectual pantheon, James Baldwin and David Graeber. Baldwin wrote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And Graeber reminded us, the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make and could just as easily make differently. I rest my case and thank you for your attention. Any questions for Professor Nyland? <laughs> yes. Can I get out of there? I have a lovely last poem that I can't seem to get for you guys. No, nope, I give up. OK. Yeah, something is not working. It's fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Any questions? What I see here is not what I see there, so. There's some confusion here. Okay. Hello. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for a very inspiring and thought-provoking uh, lecture. I wanted to uh, go back to your point too and what you said about uh, you know having the historical perspective to understand the present day and being able to. I don't know if predict or at least consider possible outcomes. And I, I agree with that, but I want your perspective of whether the rate at which um, technological advances or disadvantages, I don't know, depending on what you see it, are changing the way we live, um, are affecting that capacity to extrapolate to the present time. Is, is, is this making a difference, uh, the fact that things are moving so fast that such huge changes happen within the course of a single human generation in that capacity to extrapolate. Thank well, you. I will, of course, that's a huge question, and I spend a lot of my time thinking about that. Um, there are people who argue today that we are now post-human. Um, I don't actually see it. Uh, what I do see is that we might want to think about how we operate in our classrooms differently. Um, for example, I taught a course with Carlos Noreña, and I said, let's tell students they can't open their computers. And Carlos said, they will never stand for it. I said, OK, I'll do a deal with you. How about in the first part of the class, we tell students they don't open their computers, and then we give them the vote what they would like to do for the second half. The class voted in the second half not to have their computers open. They find it distracting when the person next door to them is doing all kinds of things. In other words, I think we all need to think about how technology aids us. We need to help students understand what it can and cannot do. I'm happy if my students use ChatGPT, um, but as an aid to thinking about um, uh, what they're writing rather than as a substitute uh, for learning to write well. So I think we need to investigate things. We need to be seen by our students not as troglodytes. I'm, I'm kind of a happy Luddite myself, but um, I think we need to know what's out there and what is the student experience um, before we can be effective teachers. But I don't think changes are happening. Maybe I've been deluded in this um, by a great book by Rebecca Solnit called It's Not Too Late. 
Um, and what that book, it's co-authored, and I, the co-author has a very long name I'm, I'm struggling to recall. Um, uh, what she's showing is that things snowball. Um, and um, so if we all do our parts, um, um, we can make a difference. And I believe that. Because what are the alternatives to believing that? Mindless despair. So I prefer to go not into that night. Good night, gently. <laughs> so anyway, yes. Um, <clears throat> I apologize for not addressing the general th themes, but I was intrigued by your description of this one and a half million Chinese voting for taxation, and it brought up my question of whether, what has influence, that is, I presume that, that, that Greece did influence Western Europe in terms of behavior, maybe that's just a myth, but what, what happened to the one and a half million people voting for their taxation, that that didn't spread, or? It's called colonialism, among other things. Oh. <laughs> and colonialism also brought overpopulation and conquest dynasties. Uh, there was a climactic pessimum. In other words, history is complicated. Um, by the way, our founding fathers did not admire, admire Athenian Democrats. They wanted this to become a republic. Um, and apparently our current Supreme Court um, also wishes us to go back. Um, some people have stated that really only white men should vote. Um, so um, I read that in today's newspaper in the New York Times. So hang on. Um, but you can't expect these straight lines. And anybody who tells you there is a straight line um, is telling you a reality. <laughs> yeah. OK, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, you, in your abstract for the talk, you talked about the bo body politic of these ancient empires, the th 300 BC to AD empires, being in better shape than we are. Is there any particular concrete lesson or application of politics that you could think of that you could trans transplant here that Berkeley could try at the scale of the university or that we could try at some other social scale that's suffering now? Well, my favorite has come from translating the documents um, and my co-translator is sitting in the audience. Um, uh, she's here from China. Um, what my favorite discovery is that contrary to everything I thought I knew for most of my life, um, the documents puts forward a notion of a sage ruler who says he does not know enough. So he is a sage in the same way that Socrates is a sage by knowing that he doesn't know enough. His remedy is wide consultation, often with people who disagree with him. That is the lesson of the documents. Um, I also just read a great book, a New York Times bestseller called Poverty in America. Um, and that book would argue, and I think cogently, that we need to think about all of the parties that benefit from poverty in America. Um, and one of the things the early empires thought they would not benefit from is poverty. So. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Professor, Professor Nalan, for a really wonderfully provocative uh, lecture. So thank you. <laughs>